Cleo is here to speak out on animal cruelty, which is what happens in this chapter. Humans versus dragon, and once again, I'm siding with a dragon. Hey guys, welcome back to the read along of the Cyborg Tinker by Meklator. I'm Kat, and we will talk about chapter 17 and 18. And by we, I mean I will talk to Cleo and she will go me. Help me. Yeah, yeah, I know. You like cuddling up to the book. Fine. So, the second competition has begun, and Rora and her newly found team are off to try and find a dragon. In the meantime, Gwen has learned that the competition has just started and she missed her chance to fix whatever she did wrong with the wiring in Mazana's foot. So Gwen is hell-bent on finding the performers now to help them and prevent a potential short-circuiting for Mazana, which could kill her. But Bastion just doesn't want to let her go because they can't afford to interfere with the competition and it could both could get both of them killed as well. And then the assumptions is like at some point he's like, but you can still help the others with the knowledge we learned last night. I'm sorry, we you were reading a smart romance novel. You didn't learn anything. The argument between Bastion and Gwen turns into a physical fight, and of course Gwen knows how to defend herself and throw a punch. Because, you know, she's badass, and being badass obviously means that you know how to beat up people. Because that's the only way that works. And Gwen informs Bastion that she knows how to throw a punch because you need to be able to defend yourself against space pirates who will board your ship. Which then makes me wonder how does all of this work? So you have no guns on your ship, so you don't have to worry about the damage to the ship, you just have to worry about boarding. And then again, how does this work? How are these sail ships in space? I mean, there is one on the front, right? So this is a proper sail ship in space. How does this work as far as your oxygen? is concerned like if they are boarding anything then they must destroy some of the hull and then you have bigger problems than like one or two people roaming around your halls right i don't know the science in this overall just doesn't make much sense to me they fight a bit more and it turns out bastion is pretty hard to beat because he seems to be made out of metal to a degree but it's okay, Gwen manages to get to her knife and goes for her favorite body part, his nuts. She accuses him of knowing about the competition and not really being willing to help. And he says like, no, I didn't know either until very recently and he more or less had to force his way into the show management team to actually be kept, to be updated about anything that's happening. Now comes the part where I couldn't possibly suspend my disbelief enough to buy this. Gwen asks about her recruitment. His gaze was distant as he stared off into the gardens. Pure chance. I'd heard from one of the manufacturers that the talented ship tinker was in town. It wasn't until I located you in Anchorage prison that I learned of your illness and thought you might be a good fit for the circus. So your circus is out of money and you randomly hear about this talented ship tinker and your first logical conclusion to this is to just throw all of the money you have left at her so you can have another tinker. His reasoning for this was we need a better tinker than Celeste. One who shows a modicum of remorse at the very least. Now I get that you want a tinker who actually gives a crap about anybody and Celeste is clearly not that. But then a better tinkerer, I would argue that Celeste is already the best tinkerer or cyborg surgeon you can possibly have because Gwen doesn't know anything and in comparison Celeste can at least install those implants. So it will be a good few years, I think, before Gwen is a better cyborg surgeon or tinkerer than Celeste. And then I'm not quite sure that the timelines actually match up because Roa, a couple of chapters ago, told you that the last Tinkerer had vanished a few months prior and now it's suddenly more than a year ago. So 
I would have to go back a couple of chapters to find out whether I remember this right, but I feel like the timeline might be a bit wonky here as well. And since Bastion is only a recent addition to the show management team, I also have to wonder what exactly was his role before? If he wasn't part of the management team, how did he have the authority to spend the last of the funds of the circus to recruit anybody? Now we learn that Bastion isn't in the circus for fun either, like Celeste has a hold over him because of his implants and she apparently abuses him to a certain degree. He doesn't outright say what exactly she's doing, but Gwen draws conclusions from him saying, I think the better question is what hasn't she done to me? And then between him not eating and Gwen thinking that the way he dresses means that he's trying to hide something of himself. So her mind goes to, did she force herself on you? I'm not a therapist either, so I would not dare to guess from somebody's behavior or the way they dress whether they've been the victim of sexual violence or not. But I also think Gwen should not be making those assumptions. Anyway, Bastion is uh, anything but happy and obviously anything but free either. Gwen is outraged. How dare Celeste do this to any person and some strange instinct took over. And it is strange indeed because it's totally out of character for Gwen, but she pulls back her knife and hugs Bastion instead and he reluctantly, at least for a second, he's reluctant, but then he just accepts the hug and they stand there hugging each other for a little bit. And this doesn't strike me as all that much in character for either of them. Gwen obviously doesn't give up on going after the other cyborgs to try and help them. Her main concern at the moment is Masana, and I don't think she thinks of Rora in this instance, which I actually appreciate because there's a main concern for her, it's the most pressing issue, and she actually concentrates on it, which is nice. For five minutes or so, Gwen can do something without belonging in Horny Jail, I guess. And there is some odd choice of words, I think, here. I have to protect the cyborgs, and I won't let some bully like Celeste fuck with my new family. Once again, I still don't know why she considers them her family all of a sudden. Like two or three of these people, maybe, but even then you haven't known them for long enough to make this call, but whatever. Also, Celeste is murdering people, or at least facilitating the murder of people. So I think the word bully is a bit weak here. Also, after Gwen and Bastion left the library and had this argument and this fight, there's still no watchman around. Apparently they all ran off to hurt the performers into the theater or something because nobody has missed Bastion or Gwen in all this time and they've been gone for almost a day now because they spent the whole night in the library as well. But nobody misses them. So. And they don't run into anybody on the way back either. I mean Bastion pulls Gwen back at some point so they don't run into watchmen. But surely they must have noticed at this point that you're not in his room. If it's close to 24 hours, like they must expect you to come out of there at some point, at the very least for food. Bastion reveals a bit about his backstory, how he was not on board with the criminal activities of his family, which is what cost him his inheritance and then led to him accepting a position in the cyborg circus because he could not afford the medical procedure he needed. He actually liked the person that recruited him, Carlisle, was the former ringleader and apparently he was more of a father to Bastion than his biological father. Bastion was also the apprentice for Celeste and helped with the first surgeries on animals, trying to create cyborg animals, which apparently didn't go so well in the beginning because anesthesia is a problem. So they in the end decided to do the work on animals with the lightest anesthesia possible. So clearly anesthesia is a thing in this world. It's just not used while you create human cyborgs because reasons the upside, at least for me, in those surgeries is that the animals get rather miffed when they wake up throughout and that's why Bastion is part metal because he got torn to pieces by quite a few 
unwilling surgery patients. Gwen does ask whether it's therefore impossible to kill him. And Bastion is replying with, not with swords or knives to the back or gut, no, he admitted. A bullet to the head or a knife to the throat would suffer, I suspect. Interestingly, he didn't look at her, keeping his eyes on the trees above. Or they've already left the castle at this point to go after the performers. It took them like only one paragraph to collect all of the things they needed, so everything else seems a bit drawn out, but not this stuff. And once again, they didn't run into Watchmen anywhere. More importantly, this last sentence, interestingly, he didn't look at her. Is it interesting though? Is it really interesting that he's lying somewhere staring at the sky while they're trying to sleep instead of looking at her? And because we have to get to a love triangle somehow, Gwen makes a sort of a move on, the, on Bastion. She sat up, I'm sorry for what happened to you, but you're wrong. His gaze snapped to hers. I wouldn't call us friends exactly, she began, but for what it's worth, you're not alone. You have me. You also have the circus and all the performers you've recruited. They need you. And then in italics, I need you. Where the hell had that come from? Since when was she cozying up to Bastion? Yeah, why are you cozying up to him exactly? I mean, now you at least have a reason to feel some sort of bond. He helped you out to a degree, even though he was reading some other book that was completely useless in the context. And you now know something of his backstory that you didn't before, so okay. Makes sense. But yeah, then this random I need you, it's like, well, you also have no other allies, really. At least none that know anything worthwhile, so yeah, I guess you do need him. But yeah, the build up to Gwen just yearning to bone Bastion as well, so, I know, it's doing nothing for me. Anyway, they do try to get some sleep in, because tomorrow they should get to the Dragon Cave that all of the other performers headed to. But they left on Grant's skimming board, so they should be a lot faster than all of the other performers. Since they're leaving from the castle to some forest, I don't see how they would take very different routes. And the others had climbing gear. I'm not sure they actually have climbing gear, but even say they have climbing gear and they move in the same direction as the performers. How did they not encounter any of them? Because all of the other performers are on foot, so they should be a good deal slower than Gwen and Bastion. And Gwen and Bastion only left hours later. In chapter 18, we're back with Rora, who is currently climbing ahead of her group, because she is the best at climbing, simply. And she's securing a route for the others up the cliff, so they actually have some security rope and don't instantly drop to their death. So, well done, Rora. Because Mazana's foot is acting up a lot more and she's limping and actually holding or slowing people down. Roa tells her to just stay at the back once they get to the cave. So if they have to run, Mazana has a slight head start. And then I think the sentence in regards to this is just wonky. Mazana's mouth drew into a thin line. Clearly, she didn't like Roa's orders as much as Roa disliked giving them. I feel like the sentence would work a lot better on the positive. Clearly, Mazana liked Rora's orders as much as Rora liked giving them. Yeah, that, that sounds better to me, but okay. After looking at a couple of caves up this cliffside, they find one that is a bit better protected and just bigger, which looks like it could actually be a dragon home. Because there's a warm wind coming from it, Rora knows, ooh, this is probably what we're looking for. So she gets out her little lamp or lantern and makes her way into the cave. She reaches the sleeping spot of the dragon and sees it for the first time and hits us with this. For a second, Rora was tempted to shit herself. A, I did not need another image of somebody ratting or shitting themselves. Second, if you're tempted to do something, wouldn't it refer to like a deliberate action of some sort? Like, 
And shitting yourself doesn't strike me as something that would fall in this category, or something you could possibly be tempted to do. She describes the dragon uh, or its sleeping position as positively feline. Which makes me wonder, which planet did Rora grow up on and did we actually bring cats into space and to other planets? Or is it just coincidence that other species would fall under feline as well? She knows of. I mean, they have some beasts at the circus, yes. But do they all come originally from Earth and have they been brought to other planets to live there or is it all just earth import and the planning is top notch again here rora's plan we wake it rora replied and try to befriend it but we should be ready if things don't go our way mazana shook her head what creature in this galaxy wants to be woken up from a nap you'll just piss it off so you didn't bring any food or anything that you know a dragon likes, but your idea is to befriend it. Okay, so you storm its bedroom or its sleeping spot, you wake it, and then you try to make friends with it, even though it has absolutely no reason to be positively inclined towards you in any way. And then also, they can't decide on a plan. That, that's the best part. Like, literally, three lines later... Mizana pointed at the dragon with her own spear. How are we going to get down a cliff with an unwilling dragon? Well, what happened to befriending it? Because if you're befriending it, then it shouldn't be all that unwilling, right? And if it's unwilling to the point that you have to fight it, then you're clearly not befriending it. And, I mean, you're screwed either way, but... Oh, if they could at least make up their mind, it would help. It takes Roa another page, but she notices. This was the creature that had ravaged their city countless times, and she wanted to have a chat with it? Yeah, Rora, is, you know, I mean, you're a master at planning, what can I say? Don't let reality stop you. She does talk to the dragon, however, as in she talks and the dragon that just woke up sits there and is like, why are you in my cave? But it doesn't attack so far, so Rora just keeps talking and informs you that it cannot understand her anyway. Even though some books that she read before claimed that dragons were capable of human speech. And I did wonder whether the dragon understands her or not, but according to her, it wouldn't. This is my favorite part of the whole chapter. The dragon was mere paces from her now, eyes narrowing. Compared to the others, she was the shortest and hopefully the least threatening to an agitated dragon. Or you're the most snack-sized. Because I think that might be more fitting than just the least threatening. You look like a walking snack to this guy. Then Broa has this strange little moment. She actually manages to pet the dragon. Clearly the dragon is a lot more peaceful than people give it credit for. But she touches it with her cyborg hand and then goes... She could sense the sharp scales on its shoulder, but not the warmth of it or the fine ridges. Slowly, she ran her hand back and forth over the scales, as though petting an animal. And I find this just weird. It's not... Okay, you're touching a dragon for the first time. Cool. You know, describe it. It's a weird sensation. I get it. But the way she puts it, it's more like, Oh, this feels strange because of my cyborg hand. You've had this hand for years. You must know that you cannot feel the warmth of somebody else under it or with it, right? So at the very least, that part should be something she should know. Second best part of this chapter. Abrakan turns up and threatens the dragon with his massive bow that looks like it was specifically designed for him, more or less, because nobody else can make use of it. And apparently it's as big as the guy is tall. The bow was massive, of a height with him, and the arrow was the size of a spear. I'm sorry, have you seen a spear before? Because that is not arrow size, no. Abrokin, sadly, makes a very valid point. So he, he aims at the dragon and Rowa steps in front of him. She didn't move from where she stood in front of the dragon. Dragons are nearly extinct, we can't just... How did you expect us to bring back the dragon? By riding on its back into the sunset? 
yeah so everyone says we need to incapacitate this dragon otherwise you know we'll never get it back to the castle and uh, yeah while i'm all for riding on a dragon into the sunset or you know wherever else you want to go possibly not back to the castle because it's probably not going to end well for the poor dragon but yeah he makes a valid point but overall it's almost like the competition makes no sense Anyway, Abrakan lets his arrow loose and the dragon actually pushes Rora out of the way. It's like, oh, okay, the dragon might have protected her. So the dragon shoots flames towards the cave entrance. Oh yeah, Abrakan came along with a couple of bodies and they killed some of Rora's new allies. That's probably why we never learned their names. They just got tossed off a cliff. But the dragon shoots flames after getting hit with the bow and actually feeling properly threatened, not just... A bit annoyed at being woken and apparently this roasts quite a few people but not Abrakan who must have been standing somewhere not too far off with a clear line of sight if he shoots this dragon with an arrow then clearly he must be in reach for the dragon flame as well but he gets out of this unscathed and others are burned to a crisp then Roa must have cyborg eyes as well, because she's standing on the inside of the cave, but then she tells you that she thought she saw several cyborgs descending the cliff. So while you're standing somewhere along inside the cave, and not at the edge of the cave, but inside the cave, you can see others climbing down the cliff? That is impressive. Or oh, it makes no sense. Your choice. But never fear, Gwen and Bastion turn up to fight this dragon as well and help the others. Well, both Bastion and Gwen have a sword and Bastion brought a shield as well, so they are currently fighting with the dragon as well. And now that Gwen is in danger, Roa is suddenly all like, oh no, I can't let this happen. So she runs up to the dragon and in an attempt to protect Gwen mm. hits the arrow that is stuck in its leg to make that worse and obviously the dragon is upset and once again I'm with the dragon on this one uh, she gets tossed to the side uh, Mazana steps out in front of her to protect her gets hit as well but just before Mazana gets hit um, Roa actually gets bitten in her cyborg hand and gets completely squashed and also causes some issues with her battery because she's currently suffering um, electroshocks so Roa is in agony you get to read about it in several paragraphs and she wishes that the dragon will end her swiftly it doesn't the electroshocks subside and Mizana gets knocked out while Roa is on the floor, she can see Gwen, Bastion, Abrakan and Faniel fighting the dragon in an effort to lead it away from them. It's like, at least half of these people don't give a shit whether the dragon eats you or not. Just... Oh yeah, somebody actually rides off on the dragon back into the sunset. Not exactly willing me, but uh, during the fight, Bastion uh, jumps onto the dragon's back and then the dragon has just had it because it had been slashed at too much and it just fucks off with Bastion on his back. Yeah. In the meantime, Gwen runs up to Rora, checks on her hand, and then moves on to Mazana, which Rora hadn't even noticed before was knocked out next to her. So yeah. This is how distracting Gwen is. You even forget that your friend might have just died next to you. Anyway, I might have said it a couple of times, but I'm with the dragon here. Screw the performers, anybody who comes for this poor dragon deserves to be roasted. Be excited for whatever Bastion is up to with the dragon now that they've flown off together. I hope it doesn't lead to anything bad for the dragon but he will probably end up as a poor cyborg animal and I am not here for that. Thank you guys so much for watching. Like and subscribe if you want to help the channel out. Let me know in the comments whether you've read the book. And who do you side with? Performers or dragons? I'll be back next week with another video. Thanks for your time. Bye guys!